So 1 Peter chapter 4 is where we're at. 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're going to read the first 11 verses. <clears throat> for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh, flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of right, speaking evil of you. Who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, and watch unto prayer. And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister to the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of, of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We start off with, in this passage, we start off with the words, for as much then as. This means certainly or according to, and it follows where in the previous chapter where it talks about Christ suffering the just for the unjust. So that's the context where you were coming into this. So it's according to that. And also everything spoken of surrounding that statement in chapter 3. But we are told here to arm ourselves with this same mind which Christ had. And especially as it concerns him coming to die the just for the unjust. He did not do this for everyone. He did this for a specific people whom God the Father promised to the Son. But he suffered. And in suffering, or while suffering, he opened not his mouth. Because he knew it was the only way he would have a people for his name. Because the God of the scripture is holy and just. He cannot just sweep sin under the rug. So my, my main point is this, the mind of Christ. So what is it that we see about the mind of Christ here in this text in verse 1? He suffered for us in the flesh. I find it so amazing that the God who is infinite would do such a thing. That he has come down to where the creature is and become as one of his creatures. Romans 8, 3, it says, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. And we must not miss it that it says in the likeness of sinful flesh because it says he knew no sin. It does not say he was sinful flesh, in other words. But man must pay for his sin. So Jesus Christ had to be a man. He had to be flesh. He suffered in the flesh, it says in our text, and he did this unto death. You and I do not have to suffer in the flesh as he did. And I mean by that, we do not have to be forsaken of God in the flesh. Because he did that for us. He suffered in the flesh that we should not have to suffer for sin in the flesh. Because when he bore our sins in his own body on that tree, he took away our sin. Even though we see it every day. But God does not see it. 
What God the Father sees is his Son. And we being in him, he sees us as righteous before him. Jesus Christ took away our sins so that we might now live to God, it says in verse 2. He died in the flesh, being made sin for us, and took away sin. But then he was quickened by the Spirit. Back in uh, 1 Peter 3.18 it says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. The only way we are enabled to live for God is through our Lord Jesus Christ's sufferings and his resurrection and ascension. All of it had to happen. But because he lives and reigns to make intercession for us, then we can live to the will of God is what it says. But the thing as it speaks up here of what Jesus Christ did <clears throat> He did for a specific purpose. This purpose was to redeem a people for his name. This has already been not done. We can neither do this, and there's no need for us to do anything, for that matter anyway. He has already done it, so all I am to do is to arm myself with this same mind. I arm myself with the mind of love to God and to my brethren because of what Jesus Christ did for me, and he did that in love. We love him because he first loved us. But the mind we are arm our, to arm ourselves with is the mind of giving honor and glory to the Son for what he has done. Turn over with me to Philippians 2. Philippians 2. And I didn't mark it, so I might not be able to find it. Philippians 2. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 10. <clears throat> Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto the death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. The suffering that we will do in this flesh is the suffering we will have when we hold forth the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified. We can suffer for other things too if we sin. We, we suffer for that, but that's we can expect that. But the suffering that we're talking about here in, in our text is the suffering of the preaching of Jesus Christ and him crucified. We honor him even though we will suffer for it for he suffered for us. Those who do not know him will speak evil of us, it says. One reason is they know us to be just like them in this flesh because we used to run with them to that same excess. But there comes a time when we at least begin not to run with them to the same excess. Romans 8, 12, and 13, it says... Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. So they know we are just like them. It also says in Ephesians 2, verses 2 and 3, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others 
But when God intervenes, and we at his appointed time stop running with them to the same excess, excess they will ridicule us. When they see, see us giving God all the glory for everything and nothing to man, they will ridicule us, and so be it. They will begin to speak lies on you, on me. As it says in our text, they think it's strange that all of a sudden we no longer walk in excess with them. So they will speak evil of you, it says. That means they will defame you. They oftentimes will not speak about the message you preach. Most of these are religious folks. So they're not going to talk about the message. They will turn and rend you. They will make personal accusations against you, knowing what you used to be. But understand, even though they do not speak against the message necessarily, sometimes they do, but not always, but understand, they hate the Christ of Scripture, and that's why they do this. But as it says here in our text, all those who are outside Christ will give an account of their doings. They were, that they were all done in un unrighteousness. They will suffer then. They will give an account for their revelings. Now, we're not here to condemn anyone because we know we were just like them. We implore or we beseech all to come to Christ. And all that the Father giveth to Christ will come to him. We just don't know who they are. The only way we know those whom God has chosen is when they believe Christ and they confess this before men and are baptized having a good conscience toward God. They will then know that what God says about them as being an ungodly sinner is true. And they know that God is an absolutely holy God and must and has to, pun has to punish sin in his son, who and his son deserves all the credit. But without the work of God for them and to them, they will never know this and will remain in their sin. They will give an account of it. This is why the gospel is preached unto us. We being dead in trespasses and in sin, the gospel condemns sin in the flesh. Verse 6. The gospel, when we hear of what Christ has done, will condemn this flesh, knowing that all it can do is sin. But by his spirit and in our spirit given us, we can live unto God, giving him all the glory. But even others, that is, man will condemn us when they see we do not run with them. They will condemn us in this flesh. You know how they'll do this sometimes? They'll say some things like this, just to name a few. You think you're better than me. They say this because we will glorify God in choosing some of fallen sinful men and women that is, chosen them to life in Christ, while others he did not choose, and they will remain vessels of dishonor. As I said before, they know we were just like them, but what they do not know is the powerful working of God. The one who can work a miracle in bringing a dead soul to life. This he does through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience of the gospel. We're just like them in this flesh, but when we become something they are not, and that is the righteousness of God in Christ, this they hate because they hate him. But we must remember that we also hated him at one time. So I still want to preach the gospel to as many as I can who will hear it. Peradventure that God, who is, who is love, might bring one of his to himself. But when they say they were, that we are just like them in this flesh, they are right. May he change them, that is, create them anew to walk in the Spirit and serve Jesus Christ. I do want to say this about the gospel. 
We are brought into life through the gospel. I know some may not think we believe that here, but we believe that. If a man or woman never comes forth believing the truth of the gospel, then they have no life. And if they never hear the gospel, they're not going to do that, right? Life is all of it. And I mean all of it as God speaks of it, not just one part. We are conceived by the Spirit of God and we're brought forth by God through the gospel. We are born of the gospel. We have no reason to believe we have life with God if we believe not his gospel. That is, we believe not his Christ in the work he has done. When this happens by the grace of God, we then also, by the grace of God, begin to walk with God and commune with God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When this happens, we will be changed. We will be different. We will go, go from being insane to being sane. We will have the mind of Christ. If you are without Christ, then you are insane. Because anyone who is not in Christ, and that is even believers before they were believers, because at one time we accounted or gave glory to this flesh for the salvation of our soul. But we are told in verse 7, the end of all things are at hand. So we are to be of a sober mind. The word means to be of a sound mind. It means to be the same sane versus insane. Insane is to give credit to man when all the credit goes to God. Sanity is when you give God all the glory, for he does truly deserve it. In fact, the height of sanity is to put man as low as you can and reverence God as high as you can by his grace. That is sanity. But with men, this is impossible. But thank God, with God, all things are possible. Let me say it in another way. Sanity is this. I am guilty before God in this flesh but I am redeemed by him. By his spirit and through his gospel, I live righteously before him. I do this by sanctifying the Lord in my heart, that is, rendering him holy in my heart. It is of a right mind that we sanctify the Lord in our hearts, knowing that he, that is God, that is Jesus Christ, is the just and the justifier of him that believeth on him. So if I am better than someone else, it's because he has made me better. I'm certainly better off than any of who are not in Christ, but by the work of Jesus Christ in him, I am not just guiltless, I am right before God. He deserves the credit because he's done all the work to make it so. That is the only way I will stand before God and commune with him as friend to friend. Then in verse 8, Peter begins to speak of charity, and that is love one to another. But not just charity alone, it says fervent charity. The word means intent. It means you love them on purpose. You choose to do this. With the end goal being this, to cover a multitude of sins. Now, this covering is not a covering to sweep some, something under the rug. How do I show love towards someone? I tell them the truth. Specifically, I tell them the gospel. But we are to speak up when someone errs from the truth, and we all should be accepting of someone Converting us from our error, although in most cases we at least at the beginning are not, not very receptive of it. But we should desire that if we be in error of the truth that someone correct us. What does James say? James 5, 19 and 20. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sin. 
It is important that we tell the truth to those around us, and especially if someone is in error. In James, there it says, from the error of his way. So when you are in error, you are reverting back to your way and not God's way. Tell them the truth, the truth of the gospel, and the gospel will hide a multitude of sins. This is not telling us to hide some criminal activity. This is telling us to tell them the gospel and them seeing God's truth rather than their truth. You hear a lot about that today. Well, that's my truth. Put away your truth and cling to God's truth. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and that's all I am by nature. I need him to cover all those sins. That's what covers the multitudes of sins, is that, what he done. It goes on to say in our text, verse 9, use hospitality. This means to be fond of guests. Make one another feel welcome. Be kind and generous to others. And as it says it here, do not do it grudgingly. Don't be hospitable to someone while behind their back or in your mind you think, I hate having to do this for them. Or something like this. They really don't need this from me. In fact, they really should be doing this for me. You know the phrase, what have you done for me lately? <clears throat> what have we done and what do we do to Christ? Why did he go to that tree? Did he complain? I thank God he did not because God the Father loves the Son and he hears him. If Christ complains about me, I'm a goner. It is the holy God who came down and gave himself for me without opening his mouth. He did not even think it. He, in fact, had thoughts of love towards us because he is the God that cannot change, and it is said of God toward us that he loved us with an everlasting love. Then we have the last two verses of our text, verses 9 and 10. The last two verses are to all the saints of God, although it does include pastors and teachers. But we should all, as God has given us, minister one to another. That is, take care of one another's needs. How many of us, by God's grace, have had their needs met? Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price so that all of our needs were met. And this is the vein in which we do all these things. When we speak one to another, we do it as God has given us the grace to do it. We cannot get out of our context, though. We do this all according to the truth of God and based on what God has done for us. We do these things in light of what Jesus Christ did for his people. He manifested his love toward us by hanging on that tree in our stead. Why should we be, not be gracious toward all those who have a like precious faith? We need to be truthful with those around us, the brethren of the Lord. It is what he has done which has covered all my sin. Arm yourselves with this same mind in Christ. He done for me that which I cannot do for myself. He did this without grudging, without, grudging, without murmuring about it. He did it because he truly loves his people. What does it say in Romans 8, verses 31 and 32? What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? We have the Apostle Peter here telling us these things about love one to another. I think Peter knows a little something of the love of Christ to his people, doesn't he? He stood and was adamant to our Lord that he would not leave him and that he would fight for him. But our Lord told him that he would deny him three times. 
when he did and he heard that cock crow, having our Lord look at him with love, he went out and wept bitterly. Undoubtedly because he was ashamed, and rightfully so. How many times do we deny the Lord in some way? But he never looks at us in disgust. We do not ever surprise our Lord with what we do. He loves us no matter what, but he deserves to be given all the glory, all the worship, and all the submission. The word mind in our text, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, the word there means thoughtfulness, and it gives an example in, in strong. It says moral understanding, but it also says intent and mind. What our Lord did was he was intent on saving his people, and he did this to the uttermost. He did it on purpose, in other words. The Lord came back to Peter because he loved him. The Lord knew that Peter was ashamed, and I'm sure he felt he was not worthy to be an apostle. But our Lord came back to him and had compassion on him. He made Peter confess that he loved the Lord. But Peter also knew and I think he knew it at that time. He knew it was only because our Lord loved him first. May God by his grace enable us, give us that same mind that was in Christ, that same intent to love Christ and to love the brethren. Tell men and women the truth, the gospel of what Christ has done. Christ is the only hope for sinners in this world. I'm going to read a quote by Charles Spurgeon to end. <clears throat> the saints are sinners still. Our best tears need to be wept over. The strongest faith is mixed with unbelief. Our most flaming love is cold compared with what Jesus deserves, and our intensest zeal still lacks the full fervor which the bleeding wounds and pierced heart of the crucified might claim at our hands. Our best things need a sin offering, or they would condemn us. Amen. Dear Lord God, thank you for allowing us to be here once again and hear words of your Son, dear Lord. <clears throat> be with us as we go out, dear Lord. Keep us safe. Keep our minds stayed on Christ. Give us the mind of Christ, dear Lord, because we all too often are cumbered about with everything else, dear Lord. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.